picture this. It's 2 a.m. and you're desperately trying to debug a critical issue in your production database service. You've been wrestling with raw SQL code for hours and it feels like you're trying to decipher an ancient language. Frustration is mounting and you're on the verge of pulling your hair out. What if I told you there's a better way? In this video, we'll go on a deep dive into the alternatives to raw SQL so you can avoid those late night debugging nightmares and make your life easier. We'll explore the pros and cons of using ORMs, SQL query builders, and raw SQL. Let's start with the most powerful but most frustrating option available, raw SQL. Writing raw SQL in your application code can be great, especially if your use case relies on the absolute best performance. At the cost of some extra boilerplate, you'll have full control over everything your database is doing, and you'll be able to freely optimize your queries exactly how you want to. However, that boilerplate can be really tricky to deal with if you're not careful. Here's a Python program that uses an in-memory SQLite database. First, we're creating a user table and an order table to model an e-commerce website. Then we're creating a couple of new users and a single new order before printing out a joined view of the order and its corresponding user. However, you might notice that we're having to create our own connection here and manage that connection ourselves. If we weren't using the contextlib.closing function here, we'd have to remember to close this connection ourselves and it could potentially lead to disastrous consequences if we forgot or if our code hits an error and doesn't close the connection. It would also be really easy to have a syntax error here since each query is just a Python string. Thankfully, my IDE is able to provide assistance, but it's not quite perfect. As you can see from the print statement when I run the code, when we run our query, we get a list of tuples in return. While this is a memory efficient way of handling our data, it also means we have to index into our tuples to access our data, which could cause a whole host of issues if you're off by one. My last issue with this code is that we're also having to manually manage the cursor object returned by executing the SQL statement. This can be great at times, especially when you're streaming an API response and don't need all the data straight away. But in most cases, it's just extra boilerplate. This is more a problem with the SQLite 3 library than the choice of using raw SQL strings, but I wanted to point it out anyway. All that said, I don't actually mind writing raw SQL queries myself. You can abstract away a lot of the complexity really quickly, and it leaves you with very fine-grained control over your database. If you ever migrate to a new database architecture, however, you'd probably have to rewrite a lot of your SQL to match the new dialect, if it doesn't already. Option two is a SQL query builder. These are abstractions that allow you to build SQL queries from the ground up using your programming language. They typically only provide functionality to translate one of their builder objects into a raw SQL string, but they can typically output to different dialects, making the migration problem a lot easier to solve. The most popular Python query builder is called PyPika, which is what I'm using here. I'll be honest, I didn't find it particularly intuitive or enjoyable to use, so let me know in the comments if you know of any better options. This code is basically identical to the last, except we've defined two PyPika table objects at the top of the module, and we're building PyPika query objects in place of using raw SQL strings in the rest of the code. Again, this might be more of a PyPika problem than anything else, but it was actually my least favorite option of the bunch. Since you're not telling the query builder all of your column names and data types up front, you don't get auto-completion from your IDE, so it's really easy to make a typo in a column name and not notice it. It's also not fully featured. PyPika doesn't support the returning keyword I was using earlier, so I've had to work around that by selecting the latest user and order each time. This is fine in this case since everything is operating within a single database transaction, but if it weren't, this query could potentially return the incorrect ID if another insert was made at the same time as mine. We also have a lot of the same problems as we had with the raw SQL example, since we're still using the SQLite 3 library to manage our database connections. Finally, this brings us on to ORMs. An ORM, or Object Relational Mapper, is typically an object-oriented abstraction on top of all your database operations. They'll handle creating connections, dealing with cursors, and will even marshal the return data into objects, so you can access the internal properties through object notation, rather than using error prone indices. Here's the same code example again, but this time written with SQL Alchemy, the most popular Python ORM. Before we look at the code, I'd like to show you the result of running it. You can see that, like before, the result from our select on the two tables is a list of tuples, except this time each tuple only contains two objects, a user object and an order object. Even just printing it, it's a lot easier to tell which data came from which table. The code itself is also pretty friendly. To define our tables, we just create classes that inherit from a base class provided by SQL Alchemy. Everything is type hinted, and we use column objects to define our column types, and use keyword arguments to specify additional objects like whether this column is a primary key or if it should be indexed. Our foreign key is defined using foreign key object. Since these tables are just Python classes, we can also define our own methods, like we've done here with Dunder Repper. You can also define your own methods from a base class, which would then be inherited by all your tables. So if you have custom martial 
marshalling or unmarshalling to a different data format, that's a great place to do it. To create our tables, we can then use base.metadata.createAll, which is a godsend when you have tens of tables that you need to set up. We manage our connection through a session object, which provides a context manager, meaning it will automatically close when the code exits or errors. To add a new row to our database, all we have to do is construct a new object and call the add method on the session, passing in the object. SQL Alchemy will even take care of updating the object with any auto-generated data from our database, like a primary key or a date time, so we don't need to worry about returning that ourselves. Again, since these are Python classes, we get full autocomplete, meaning our IDE can warn us of any typos we make. If we were using a compiled language, we'd even learn about these things at build time, making it nearly impossible to write an invalid query. As you can see here, SQL Alchemy also provides its own query builder, but since it knows a lot more about the tables it's working with, this is much nicer to use than PyPika. Also, since everything is just represented with Python objects, it's really easy to change the dialect you're using and connect to a new database, much like with the query builder option. Personally, I love using ORMs, though I don't actually use SQL Alchemy directly very often. Instead, I use SQL Model, which is an abstraction on top of SQL Alchemy and Pydantic, as it provides excellent data validation and works really nicely with FastAPI, making it unbelievably easy to make your whole backend in Python. ORMs aren't without their drawbacks though. You don't get as much control over exactly what SQL is being run on your database, and there is typically an overhead that comes with all the marshalling and unmarshalling of data into these objects. There are so many options to choose from when you need to interact with a database. Hopefully, I've helped shine a bit of light into the space, so you can pick a technology confidently when starting your next project. If you're interested in how learning SQL to a high standard can make your code 400 times faster, watch this video here.